committee. We'll call the meeting to order. First up is public comment. This is anything not on the agenda. Seeing anybody jumping up and down. Is that just from a special hearing or is this for the we're doing like control board. Yeah, liquor control board. Oh. Do you want to talk about liquor? No. <laughs> <laughs> the zoning was at 530 though, wasn't it? Or it comes as the first item on the Ah, first okay. Meeting. All right, I was out. Approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh consider licenses, liquor licenses, new and renewal. There, sorry, there, uh, there's just Bob's M and M is the only one we checked the other day, so that's it says current at least through then. Anybody have any challenges with Bob getting his license? <laughs> no, I don't know. Uh, motion to meeting to order. Uh, first up is the public hearing on the land use regulations. Did everybody get the email that came in kind of late this afternoon? Yeah, I saw it. I've not had a chance to open it. The one from Matt Morosky. Yeah. I have a couple of printed ones here if anybody wants it. So the main well, concern that he's raising is over the floodplain overlay. Thank you. And how much it's going to change what people can do and where they can do it. And it is pretty drastic. So for those that, um, it brings up that down on Route 14 in East Randolph, even on the east side of the road, they won't be able to do anything. I'm pretty sure that when we were talking about this in the planning commission, we, we we really took that concern very seriously. And I don't know if we had, I can't recall now, maybe Jeff remembers, if we had an official vote on that particular item. But I do remember there being a lot of concern about its impact and that we, we probably need to do more um, research before we change that particular regulation. Yeah, I have a quote from T. Rourke on that. Um, this is pretty much a direct, direct quote. It says, in this day and age, it's ludicrous to do any development in the floodplain, especially in the 100-year 100, 100 floodplain. They'd actually like to see it go to the 500-year floodplain, but they're keeping it 100. Um, according to them, there's plenty of land to develop outside of the floodplain. And if you're planning to develop in the floodplain, you're pretty much guaranteeing that the town is going to have flood damage. That's so do there. they want to buy the land and the properties of all those people down through East Randolph? If it's there, it's there. Can't this is new anything. development. There's Until it goes down, you can't build it back. That would probably be true, yeah. I don't and know. development could be like a 10 by 20 building, too. It yeah. could be a shed. Well, you're wiping out all the down. houses in East Randolph. Well, it's point, what is it, point zero? Bit, the bit one, the zero same. point one foot, isn't it? That's all we're talking? So yeah. The, the, change would, the change would make it really hard to do. Oh, it's one point. Yeah, basically they're saying no new, no new development in the floodplain. It would only apply to new. At this right. point, right? right? This new no, one would be zero, but it's one foot. It's one now, it's one right. Now. Yeah. Yeah. This would apply only to new development. It wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't address existing development. But I still think it would be best to maybe have more planning commission time with this and have T-Work actually come in and discuss it with us and 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 address like not just in writing but like in a back and forth way with like with Matt about because he's also a he's a river engineer. He is a river and knows engineer, a lot right. about this yeah. kind of stuff. So I think we'd really profit from hearing that discussion rather than just you know, here's what we think is our official policy. Because yeah. I there, I think there's a, there's there sounds like there's some really good arguments on both sides. I think eventually as we continue to take away people's ability to use their land, that has to be reflected in their values and what they pay for it. 
you know, somebody whose house been they had wiped out and they can't build it back, now they got land that they can't do anything with, shouldn't be paying the same for that as somebody who is up higher and doesn't have any risk. I mean, that's, that's really a land value question. I mean, yeah. so I don't know how the assessors deal with that. They don't. With that. They don't. There is no value or change for that. And I'm just saying, like, if we're going to even make it worse yeah. with that type of change, that's something we ought to be really looking at. Yeah. I mean, it does seem like really the real change is not what we do here. It really has more to do with the thing, much increased public perception of the real dangers of building in these areas. And if I owned land that was in a river corridor and floodplain, like, I would be a whole lot more careful in knowing what I know now than what we knew. 10 years ago, or especially pre-Irene, where the awareness just wasn't there. It's, it's nothing like that had happened in such a long time, but now it's happening more and more. And so, I think for a lot for a lot of folks, even if we're not, even if we're not uh, um, officially taking this into account when we do our assessment, which we probably should, um, it is going to be reflected in what people are willing to pay for for properties. I would think. Um, but we have. You wiped uh, out all of the Route 14. Right, because none of those, you can't do anything on any of that land. You got to stay with what you got, and if it gets wiped out, you can't replace it with this change. Is what Matt's saying. And how does? I mean, maybe we could just get more information. Right, I mean, like, how I'm, does I'm not that, saying that we sh that we shouldn't look at this get, in more detail. No, I, I'm just that's responding what I'm saying to is part of the issue. Is, yeah. I think, and I don't. I bet you nobody down through there knew that. Has no <laughs> idea what that. But I think it's wiped out, makes. and they need to rebuild. I don't think you can. If you're not allowed to build in the floodplain, I don't think you can. Right, rebuild. but like, it, yeah, but if there's a possibility of getting insurance or FEMA, like, how does FEMA look at something like this? Like, if the town changes it to. A, I don't believe this would affect FEMA's regulations at all. The one foot is a magical number around communities around Vermont. And that's FEMA, the biggest one foot above the biggest. That's, no, that's FEMA's number. We're, but we're not changing FEMA's number. We're, we're only, we're, said they were going to zero. No, no, no. When I'm, right. We, that would be just yeah. for our local regulations. Yeah. But it wouldn't, yeah. so that's that would just affect our local that. regulations. It wouldn't affect how FEMA approaches a disaster. They have their own rules that they go by. They don't, as far my understanding is that any, any change that we do here wouldn't affect like their policy. So like if, if FEMA said that we're gonna, you know, give you money for your for your damage, um, that's not going to be affected by what we do here. But anyway, I don't think we should spend too much time on this because we're gonna re revisit this um, you know later on after the planning commission I think has a much more thorough look at, at what the issues really are. So are we just doing another hearing to get more input tonight? This isn't a Adopt obviously. Okay, um, I'm good with that. Though. Can I make a we, comment? Um, if we leave it as it is, I, I don't know if we want to abandon not having this be the approval. It's, it's got a few minor changes, and this one we can leave as it is, and talk about it in the planning commission and make recommendations later. So that you can't do that. Okay. So any changes? Mean, I think we've got to. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it, a minor change. Right. Yeah. You can like a grammatical thing or yeah. something. Tiny. Well, this would be no I guess change if we left it like it is. It would be no change. Just leave it where it is for now. Just an option. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, why why can't we just approve the ones which we know we're going to approve, or that we you know that we like? At least I think we should approve, and then take for instance this one where we have questions, and just and just leave it alone. And then if the planning commission, you know, it might, I don't know how long it's going to take the planning commission to work through this issue. Maybe we can do it next month. Maybe it takes six months, you know. Yeah. But I don't think we should hold up all the other changes while we do that. So we talked about the only ones that were going to go forward were the ones that were required in the statute change. Mm -hmm. There was a conversation about <coughs> whether a road and a river or something. <laughs> Maybe. Can there, in front? there was a conversation about whether roads or rivers should be natural subdividers, and I don't know that we ever got to the answer no, I just on that one either. Good. And that's still in. Um, and we could do the same thing with that. We can, we can take longer. 
a more, close, more close look at that. Um, that's reasonable. But then he talks about his other issue is over the square footage per lot and the village high density. And I only got part way into reading it, so if somebody else already read it, they could summarize it maybe. I think this is one where there's just... And that's also on the DRB, too, so people are aware. So he enforces this as people come in. So it's, it is a real-world situation. Can I, enter, can I just introduce talk myself? Or ask you talk, me, have a comment? What are you, or, what are you referring to, Paul? I'm so referring to... My, you, no, that there might be many changes after there's people that have spoken tonight. And you guys seem like you're hung up on this one. No, we just moved to the next one that Matt had, which is... Um, the mandated, it's the size, the minimum lot size mm -hmm. in the Randolph Village high density area. A 5,000 square, I have concerns with that too, but I didn't know the agenda was being driven by well, a phone. Because <laughs> I had some comments on the floodplain too. Well, I've been well, on the plane. He, he sent these in. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, and, I'm sorry, Trini. Yeah. The, the, I'm here the, in person the, and I had some more right, comments on the floodplain. Right, plane. right. Yeah, no, the, the change is. That we're that we're referring to, are have been have been warned. It's just that we've got an email about those changes. This is kind of like written testimony that we're hearing from. Oh, okay. So, you go through them first so, so, so the floodplain one we just pulled out. That one won't go forward tonight. I, it's going back. I was raising my hand so I could give a little background. I was on the planning yep. commission for 12 years. Then we worked with Two Rivers on a creature to come up with a floodplain stuff. I think what Matt's talking about is the change of one foot above base foot elevation mm -hmm. to zero. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that's what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. All other towns around in the state of Vermont are at one foot. Our regulations did come from FEMA. We wrote them from guidance of two rivers. We thought they were way too strict, but we wrote them but they, the way they were. Um, they were written by two rivers and the, the feds. Um, it's yeah. the change of one foot to zero, mm -hmm. and I would rather keep it at one foot, and you're good. Yeah, sounds like you should come to our next planning commission meeting. Uh, I'm not a Randolph resident anymore, so I and shouldn't suppose that too. You, but you can, you can still I, we, come. I can help you out a lot on that. Um, you I used you, to you can still come to the meeting and have input. And in fact, planning commission members okay. don't actually need to be Rand Randolph residents. Just yeah. the majority need to be Randolph residents. Okay. So, and then my other comment is, I used to own Eagle Mount Campground in Braintree, which was in the floodplain, and everything I did, I had to go through. Ned Schwanziger and Sasha Feeler on floodplain. Any buildings that I had to do, and everything was one foot above the base foot elevation. And I really think you're going to affect a lot of folks, even like sheds and stuff. We're talking, it's really, yeah. uh, one foot doesn't seem yeah, like it's one. We're not going to make that decision here tonight, so. Okay. All right? Yeah. Here you go. All right. I, I totally agree with Matt. Let's leave it where it is. I'll third that. <laughs> Paul and I were right there together when the Queen of showed up. Yeah, we were there. <laughs> and that's how we get money from roads and stuff like that, too, because we signed up for the program. Like, get about 100, was it 100% reimbursement? Yeah, there were three options. And, and so we went with the more stringent on the floodplain regulations when we did it, when they proposed it to us, so that we could get money after so we get floods for roads. So, so, yeah, so if, it can't, so if we were determined to be Vermont in, does that. in the design, Yeah, it was so really smart. Can't. It behooved us. It was hard to do, but financially for the town and that putting them at risk, it was a big deal. Yeah. And to go to zero, it was like, that's it. <laughs> All right, minimum lot size in the village. So. I can give a quick summary of that if you'd like. Yeah. The minimum lot size is five, is proposed to be 5,000 square feet, and the minimum lot size per dwelling is 3,000 square feet. So it seems on the surface that there is an issue with that, but again, Two Rivers out of Quichi's recommendation is not to go below 3,000 square feet for minimum because that's pretty tight. And, it, and really what that means is if you have a 5,000 square foot lot, you have one dwelling on there, but just increased by 1,000 square feet to 6,000 square feet, now you can, or larger, and you can go on it, so, and you can build two units on that. They didn't recommend going below 3,000 square foot per dwelling unit, even in the village. 
So is the recommendation to go up to 6,000 square feet? No, they, if you leave it like it is, it's pretty straightforward. It just means, well, we could do that, yeah, but they said, again, that it was fine as it is. It just, you know, there's a little crossover there, basically, where if you have a 5,000 square foot lot, you're not going to put two dwellings on it, but 6,000 you can. And you could raise that up to 6,000 square feet, but it kind of, you know, it, that that's what would happen anyway. So, <coughs> no, today we're that, at 10,000. Right, today we're so, at 10,000, yeah. yeah. So and this would go down to 5,000 per individual, but then if you had 6,000, you could actually put another dwelling on there. So it really does the same thing. And it, it, at first, when you read it, it does seem like it's contradictive, but it really isn't unless you really want to, you know, they did not recommend increasing the minimum lot size and they didn't really increase the, or decrease the um, 3,000 square feet per dwelling unit. And the bottom line is that the statute says eight dwelling units per acre is the minimum that we can do. So and that's basically what's driving this. I, I think, with all due respect to my good friend, Matt Borowski, I think going too far with his proposal is, is premature because the Planning Commission has not had a chance to look at his ideas. And the only, the only thing that, that the Planning Commission has actually voted on is changing the 10,000 square foot minimum lot size to 5,000. And, and that's something that we, that we need to do to conform, correct, Jeff? Correct. No, um, um, to no. conform to what? To the to the That's state land to the state um, <clears throat> regulations around around zoning. Yeah, it could actually be a little bit bigger than that <clears throat> because the statute is eight dwelling units per acre. So if you do the math on that, which I don't have my calculator so it, with, yeah, it could be slightly but, bigger. Than yeah, that. it's slightly bigger, but this would allow for that to happen and just regulate, um, you know, close to that size. It's not an exact number. We're not going exactly to the. Um, number as long as we have a minimum of it allows a minimum of eight dwelling units per acre then we comply. Does that make sense? So so basically we have to go to five. If we want it to be bigger, it could be slightly bigger than that. Whatever forty three thousand five sixty divided by eight is. About fifty four hundred. What's that? It's about fifty four hundred. Fifty four hundred. So if we wanted to strictly comply with the with the state statute, we could go to that number. The planning, planning commission, right on the, edge. the planning commission just went with 5,000. You know, it's all kind of arbitrary at this point. It doesn't really matter that much. Trina, there's a question from the audience. Yeah, I was just trying to figure out what that, what the difference ends up being if you did. Is it a maximum of eight units <laughs> per acre? Is that the way the stand? No, the it's, a minimum. Minimum. it's a minimum. The zoning density needs to be a minimum. And that's coming from where, from the state? From, from um, state statute that was passed last year. In S, it was S100, I can't remember the act, I, can't, I don't know the act number. And so now, like, they're writing our zoning for us? Or I mean, they're it's the state handed yes, down between them and two rivers. The state, like the state, the state is, is, is giving us more, more guidance around, what kind of, around certain aspects of zoning. And they're writing our zoning. <laughs> they are if it's a mandate. Yeah. She said they are if it's a mandate. Thank you. Um, okay. And is that, so are we discussing the 5,000 now? Because that was one of my other concerns. Well, yeah. we, well, that's what we're on is the minimum lot size, yeah. whether we go with 5,000 or we kick it back for more. But can I make a comment at least? You can. Right. So, I was on the board. We went with 10,000. That's a quarter of an acre in the village here. If we go to 5,000, then you're going to have two units. Where are people putting snow, trash, like outbuildings? Is there, like, it doesn't matter. We don't have a choice. I guess I'd like to find that out first, if we have a choice or not, because it's in state statute. All right. Yeah. And we have, yeah, to, and we have to, to see. We have, we have to do eight. eight you know, our, our regs have to comply with eight per acre. But even like if you have a snowboard, you're blowing it onto somebody else. Oh, yeah. and again, just, this is in the high density 
Yeah, I don't just most of the I, I hear your concerns. It's, I, I it's not really something that we have a lot of flexibility with. Right? And, you know, I couldn't imagine putting it to five. I have six lots on two and a half acres. The marketability. It's, All right. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are places in the world that are, where they're much smaller. I mean, it, it can be done. It's but not we can like, have that, too. We don't want that here. But <laughs> I'm just I'm just saying. If My concern was the, the ten thousand. At the at the end of the day, though, we have to comply with state statute, and so we can argue about it here, but we're not going to change what we, we need to do. To. We can challenge it. But. <laughs> we've done it. No, we've done it before. I mean, we're just <laughs> we getting just, this stuff handed to us, you know. That but we spend a lot of time on it. It's not it's not a fight that we're going to win. But wouldn't this allow some of the buildings that already exist to then be split into a duplex, but it's the same building, right? And so the footprint's the same, but we're allowing to have an extra unit inside of the already existing building, right? That's another, that's that's another that's section another, in here. That's a whole so you could build two buildings. So you could add another building. And, and then you could take those two occurred. buildings and split them into multiple dwellings. Could, right. Yeah. So you could end up with, you know, that's common is there's many triplexes. Yeah. In there, so you could have six mm. units on. I'd love 6, to see the statue. That's on six thousand square feet, right? I'll, I'll take a look at it. You know, someone could send it to me, or I would love to. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Way to get that done. Yeah. Okay. All right. And the statute requires it where only in designated downtowns, or is it? How does the state yeah, yeah. define that? It's, I think it's a village. That is a good question. I'm pretty sure it's just high density village. So if we don't call it that, then we don't have to do it? Like, what what defines the area we have to have that type I of information? I don't know. I think it's all part of the incentive program about the state creating... Designated downtowns. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. But that, you wouldn't get the Act 250 permit. You wouldn't need an Act 250 permit if you hook the town water and town sewer in those districts. And then they also allowed you to have smaller right-of-ways. Like, right now in our zoning, we allow 50-foot right away. We only allow 50-foot right-of-ways in the village. We had changed the zoning so that someone could come in front of the board and it could probably go to 20 or 30. This, this is all completely independent of activity. All right, I, I really would like to see the statue. I'm going to try to stay up on it. I haven't yeah. seen yeah, yeah. Uh, anything because that is this, the mud in our, our zoning. <laughs> there, I mean, we're local people. We spent a lot of time on that. We planned out our community and then to find out that a, a token just be passed and taking it, that, that's local control gone. <laughs> That's just that's a concern of mine. Mm -hmm. A concern of mine too. Was there other comments on this section about the square footage in the high density area? I think this means that we should definitely not go below what we have written here, where it's five thousand per lot size and three thousand per dwelling unit. We definitely don't do not want to go below that from what I'm hearing anyway. Well, I don't I think we should just but this, the piece, the planning commission has not had a chance to talk about the per unit um, minimum, so I think we should just leave that suggestion and that's for for another time. Mm -hmm. um, I think the the five thousand square foot um, rule is one of those conforming changes that we're being asked to do, and and I think we need to move forward with that part of it. Okay. Are there other sections that we're supposed to be looking at? That people are <laughs> um, my other issue, well, two, we've already hit two of them. The other two are about the town road natural subdivisions and rivers. That really concerns me all around the state of Vermont. Um, Vermont DEC rules, uh, statute 301, talks about the state recognizing town roads as natural subdivisions and also rivers of, was it 10 radius? I ten, it's, it's 10. So this is subchapter three, referring to subdivisions with the state of Vermont DHC. Parcel means any contiguous land owned or controlled by a person. Tracts of land owned by a person which have in common one or more points on any boundary which are divided only by an easement or interest consists of less than fee simple and it shall be deemed to be contiguous for the purpose of this subchapter. Tracts of land which are divided by state or municipal highway right-of-ways or surface waters within a drainage area of greater than 10 square miles shall not be deemed contiguous. That's the state statute. So we're going opposite of that. 
Town roads are always a natural subdivision. So are rivers. And so are rivers. They are for Act 250 also. Yeah, and we're being more stringent. Yeah, and I, I think and every other town does this. I've wor I've run into cases like in Braintree. Yeah, I, but I think we also decided that we weren't going to be deciding that one tonight. Yeah. Also. Trevor has weighed in and said we're making changes that go into the major category by pulling mm -hmm. these, and it's going to have to come back out. And, and I'm willing to come to the planning. I apologize. I usually don't wait till the last minute on things like this. I know this is your last year, but I've been in Florida. My mom, I had to go check on her, and I've been there for two weeks. I missed her at the class meeting. And then I came and spoke to Jeff last week about my concerns. And so I hate to wait to the last minute, yeah, but. Well, let's continue this conversation. Okay. And, and it, that's my big one is that we not do that because um, every other town looks at town roads, snap subdivisions, and rivers in a 10 mile drainage. Yeah. No, I appreciate your, okay. uh, your, 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 your insight and your experience. All right. Extremely yeah. valuable, and I want to hear it. Okay. I, I think appreciate the rest it. of the Planning Commission will really want to hear it. All right. All right. Yep. Yeah. When is that next meeting? So we can all. It's, we have a regularly scheduled meeting the fourth Thursday of the month. At six o'clock. Do you have any other parts of the proposed changes that people want to bring up? Yeah, go ahead, just put your name on the record. Oh, Nancy Rice from Randolph Center. Um, well, to me, these changes are huge for our town. You know, I'm kind of blown away by the expansion of what's allowed. Um, and I was hoping that someone from the Planning Commission might give a, a brief overview of the major things. Um, I think a lot of people don't keep on top of this, even though I understand once the select board okays these proposed changes, that's kind of it. Um, and I wonder also, I mean, the, the number of Houses can be on a, an acre is a lot, and I think it would matter on the type of soil and the topography of that part that's going to, you know, they want to build on. So, to me, this is a developer's dream, and I, if a lot of developers lined up and because they'll love these, um, I think. I wonder how the town is going to deal with, say, an influx of development. Um, this, this is only for the high density areas of town. It's, this is not town wide. This is only a, a relatively small part of the town that this actually applies to. No, I'm talking about like in Randolph Center. And yeah, Colorado. I don't, I don't yeah. see Randolph yeah, Village high density district. Yeah, yeah this, this, doesn't, high this doesn't really apply outside the village. But, can can you put the, a lot of houses in other parts of town? Those, there's no changes to the number of houses you can put in other parts of town on the regulations. There's changes okay. to the floodplain and a few things like that, but not into the the density of housing. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's how I read it. It's um, just there. It's just a <coughs> little section around that village high density district that oh. we're talking about. The rest of it, it's nothing changes. It's, it's for okay. town water and town sewer. It's just right here in the village in a high density district. So that doesn't apply to Randolph Center? It does and not. Other no. It does not. No. Well, it makes me feel better. <laughs> well, I'm dead, I'm dead. <laughs> it is in the Randolph Village high density district. This be, there are some things that are changing that apply, just not. Mm, not you bad. can't put eight houses on an acre of land out in Randolph Center. Mm, yeah, that's right. mm, yeah, no way. That's well. only in the. Good, because you could tell I was a little upset by that. <laughs> but um, was there something in it about development being um, relaxed in these ways for a quarter of a mile outside of a village? Is, am I right about that, Larry? Um, you might be referring to the neighborhood development, the neighborhood, the, the NDAs, the neighborhood development areas, which are um, which are a quarter mile, like walk, because a quarter mile is like how far people can be expected to, to walk to something in general. And so the, this, the quarter mile is a, sort of a boundary around the designated downtown area that a neighborhood can be in. And that's a state program that encourages neighborhoods around 
more densely populated, more densely developed downtown areas. And there are special incentives that go along with those special designated areas. And, and we have um, one of those in Randolph that surrounds our downtown. It's just in the downtown now. Not outside the downtown? Mm -hmm. No, it's just a circle it's, and it's high. It's that same district. It's, it's most of the neighborhoods which are directly connected to the downtown. Mm -hmm. And it's not even all of them. Okay, because I was wondering how, who decided what the, the designated, whatever that phrase was you said. Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically the, it's, it's, there's, it's more subtle than this, but it's, it's more or less that quarter mile outside the boundary of the designated downtown. And not and other it, parts of town? Not other parts of town, no. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Good questions. Any other comments? This is my last one. <laughs> and this one is... Good, this one's only got one more. <laughs> <laughs> this one's a little more self-serving, actually. Um, as you folks know, I'm one of the owners of the hotel. And there's been a long history of Exit 4 um, zoning up there, and a lot of it's been conserved with the whale's tails, and then behind Brinker's. Um, basically, with the planning commission, when I was on it, we had always talked about rediscussing that now that all, all that's conserved and stuff like that. And I noticed looking at the new maps that all they all we've done so far is just leave the hotel site and over by the state garage in the interchange district. I hope to be able to have conversations with the planning commission that we relook at that um, at some point. So I, I, it's more than just moving districts around the map. Um, I don't think we're doing ourselves justice in my opinion, so. Okay. Love to hear more about it. Sounds okay. like yeah. you got some quality time on the fourth grade. <laughs> 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 that, that's more of a self-serving personal thing that we had always talked about after we had done the conservation that we would relook at the zoning both for the barn building and anybody that's in that district and just moving a district up and getting rid of it doesn't really solve the problem, I don't think. That was supposed to happen in the post Hugo era. Mm. That was part of the arrangement that was going to be taken up by the planning commission, but it never got there. Okay. And that was all with Sam's project, you know, the the massive part of it. But I, I think things have really changed since things have been conserved up there and people got their got the view shed and open ag lands and stuff. Yeah. yeah. I think we could be a little bit more flexible. Remember we're one of the fortunate ones that we do have town water or town sewer along Route 66 on an interchange. So if we're thinking, <laughs> it, it, it's a big plus, and we don't want to turn people away with our zoning, in my opinion. Noted. Thank you. Any other comments? Hearing none. We'll close that part. Um, so you, want to, you don't want to move forward with okaying the ones that we have to okay? No, maybe Trevor can weigh in here, but he sent a thing saying removing these pieces is a major change. We'll need another hearing. The pieces can go back to the Planning Commission without them taking any action on those and only fixing the ones that are commented on. Meaning that we'd be having a major change to the Planning Commission's recommendation? And that's why we would need to send it back and not be able to. He's live and in person. Okay. Yeah. It, it's a process piece from statute where it's you've got minor and major changes, and there was some allusion to which was which. And if you make if you consider a minor change, you just add some process back in. So you'd have a hearing on the amended proposed changes, which wouldn't include the other pieces, and then you could adopt those after that. So you could based on the timing, probably get that done on the June 13th meeting. So my stuff is more for, I think, typos, corrections of that, maybe a little bit of clarification of language, but if you strip whole pieces out, even if there's broad agreement, that's usually considered major, or it's more safe to consider it major. And you can always make the determination that it's not, but it's safest just to have the extra process step okay. so that you don't lose on appeal because of that. Okay, so so Trevor, what you're saying is that at our next planning commission meeting, we should revisit this 
take this select board conversation into account, presumably not speaking for the Planning Commission, but assuming the Planning Commission would most likely then take those pieces out that we just talked about taking out, re-vote on a new package, which would be presumably what we're talking about here, which is just the state mandated changes, and then it would come back to the select board as just those changes, which we could then start the, the we can then have the public process at the select board level. Right, yep, so we, you're effectively gonna strip them out, so the planning commission has to amend its report, I think is what statute says, or how it describes it. The amended report then becomes the basis for the new hearing, and then you take action after the new hearing. Okay, thank you. You can Indeed. do it negative one now, Paul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can I just make a pathway forward, possibly? The only changes we're talking about is what are state rules about what you're saying for statute. Yes. So if the state statute says that, I'm fine with the 5,000. What I'm referring to is from the Vermont DEC rules, and we don't want to be more stringent than Vermont DEC right, rules. Right, right. We're, we're, we're going to have a lot more conversation about those. Before. What we're talking about is taking those sections completely out. I know, but we might be able to do that tonight so you don't have to have other hearings. No, what, what Trevor is saying is... Okay, right. Yeah, what Trevor is saying is that because of the way the, the, the statute is around process around mm -hmm. all this, that, that, that because we're, we can't make any decisions around those big pieces here, I mean, we basically we have to kick this back to the plan. Okay, commission. you know, I understand that, but I'm trying and to then, get the pathway forward. And if you left the one foot on the floodplain, you were there. And so, you know, to have all these special hearings, which is already in place on the one foot floodplain, and if on the other two you go back to the state statutes, you've not, that's, that's all your... But I, I believe... What yeah, that's just my opinion, but okay. Yeah, it's more about what you're removing front. So you've got an amendment before you that has all the stuff in it. And by removing anything, even if there's broad agreement on the stuff that remains, that's what constitutes the major change and just sends mm -hmm. you back through that process loop again. Right. That, so that makes sense. I'm just, just trying to. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I think they're doing it. It's easier. Have, have more meetings. And think, yeah. Take more people's time. Oh, we're that's, not that far off. Right? No, I, I hear you. Yeah. That would be wonderful. I just, I don't, it sounds like what you're yeah, no, saying. Cool. I'm just, we don't have a choice. Yeah. I'm an optimist. I like to try to figure out how to make things happen. Totally appreciate it. I have a question. Trevor, I don't, could you identify the Vermont DEC role or whatever? He's the town manager. Oh, town manager. Okay. Yep. Uh, I was going to just be the random voice from afar. He's the entire <laughs> town of Randolph. <laughs> 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 right, <yeah. laughs> All right, let's move forward. Public comment. This is for anything not on the select board's agenda. Crickets. Approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Consent calendar. Meeting minutes and warrants. Uh, there was a missed detail on the min meeting minutes of the DOD appointment. It was not listed on the meeting minutes. Or, um, I forget. This person off. Chris. Thank you. So, can we, how do we get a motion? Is that amend it? We can motion with that amendment. Great. So motion to approve the minute. With, with that change. Yeah, that change. So moved. Second. Making sure Judy's going <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Sorry. <laughs> Business. Consider adopting the proposed changes to land use regulations. Yes, we are through that one. B. Outdoor seating requests from Sweet Scoops. Yeah. So, so you did this last year that we have all the certificate of insurance stuff. It's the same rough layout. Right, because I didn't realize it was muted um, with the approval agenda. I think you could still do it because you're considering outdoor seating requests. Short notice put one in. We received it yesterday as well. I don't know if you want to try to consider both at the same time. Otherwise, they'd have to wait until June. And both places have had the outdoor seating with very little issue. They maintain accessibility in terms of the widths on the sidewalk. Um, and we've got both of them have supplied the certificate of insurance with the town listed as an additional insurance. We have, have those in hand. Yeah, my agenda has 
So um, I'm not sure. I don't think I need to refuse myself, but I'm a neighbor of Sweet Scoops and manage the building. So, yeah. I don't Should I refuse myself in this? Or? You know, it's not supposed to be like you're getting any personal gain out of it. No. Nope. They're going to give you a cone. <laughs> <laughs> and that might not be. <laughs> I think that's I think that's just want to make sure there's no discussion. Anybody want to make a motion to approve them? I'll make that motion. Second. Those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Very Salisbury Square Road discussion. Again, this one comes up every so often. You're on mute, Trevor. Yeah, so this is a continuation of the April conversation. One of the things that I wrote to you in the materials that it might be helpful to recognize the process point we're at and to maybe more narrowly construe the conversation. Um, what you're not being asked to decide is whether or not to adopt the road. This is whether or not to set an amount for a construction, um, a bond for construction, so that it puts it into the process as envisioned in the almost 30 year old road adoption policy. It would protect our interests. There is nothing being committed by setting the bond uh, amount other than it provides that level of protection should there need to be some sort of corrective work and or um, need to finish something that was undone at some point. And then one of the other things we've recommended to setting at the same time, even though everybody's already agreed, is the um, provision that we'll hire an engineer, set out a, a sample scope of work, and I can go through that with you all too. Um, and then RACDC, as the applicant, would pay for that. This is pretty common practice up in, say, Chittenden County. Um, we're doing quite a bit more with the housing stuff. Remember this from my own tours up in that area as well. So really what this conversation, trying to boil it down to what's the action point that we're at. Um, and those are the two that I think when Mark and I have talked about it, when we've sort of tried to review um, where we're at, that's where we've tried to really just narrow it down. There are still some outstanding questions that have to be answered from, from last time, snow storage and removal. Um, that can kind of happen in, in this first step as well. Uh, sort of the quick and dirty. You have some materials from last time related to, um, there was a, a table where there was a suggested bond amount from Julie's folks put that together and sent that over. Um, it excluded some of the total road costs, so some of the questions with that table is, do you like the $230,000 number for part of it? Should stormwater be in it, for example, since it has a major impact on how a road performs in short and long terms, potentially? Do you like the whole construction amount? You know, where in that spectrum should the bond amount be set? All the policy says is the full cost of construction, and then tries to prescribe that you pick the later of one of two dates. Um, and in this case, based on the process we laid out, the later date would be one year from adoption. Um, if you chose to do so. So that's why that's part of that analysis that you received. So the analysis of cost is a million dollars, but there's no contingency in it. Um, looking at typicals right now, the contingencies are upwards of 20%. Which would put this at 1.3. May I say a word? Sure. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, so, for the LURs, the full cost of construction plus 15% would be the contingency, is what's in the LUR, and not 20. Um, and if you want it, the, the way you could do the uh, once the select board has deemed the project is complete, you would then be able, the, the surety bond would then stay in place for two additional years after that, at which point uh, the, it would end uh, and there would be one final, they would, the, the final paperwork would then be submitted for, the, for everyone, if everyone's satisfied with where, where you're at. Um, so there's a couple more uh, little points within the LUR in terms of what uh, RACDC would provide you in this case, um, but the in terms of the actual figures, it's the full cost of construction plus 15% contingency. You could go out for once the the select board is deemed the project is complete. Two years from that date 
is is what's in the NUR. So it's a million two sixty-five versus a million three. And then do we have a? We don't have a quote yet from the engineers that were reached out to. For this type of service. One decline wrapped around to another one that was recommended. I haven't had that response back yet. I'm going to try another one here to try to make sure that this keeps moving on. But, so, for a cost of that scope of service, I don't have a price yet. So, just to quickly review the, the scope of work we're talking about is that there's a pre site uh, or a pre sort of a, an initial inspection of all of the site plans. There's a Pre-construction site inspection that would include Julie's contractor and anyone they wanted to include, um, highway super engineer, all those folks. There'd be a minimum number of inspections set. I don't think this is a um, you know, it's fairly level ground in terms of the paving project. So I suggested three. It might depend once we see what a construction calendar looks like, whether that number is appropriate, whether there should be more. Try to work it in a way where the, the right number is there. The engineer would pick which points are appropriate um, based on their professional expertise. And then we would effectively have, um, when we do our own projects, there's usually two markers. There's a substantial completion and a final completion. And the idea being that at substantial completion, you go through, you, you make a punch list, and you figure out if there's anything undone, anything that needs to be fixed, altered, shored up. So we try to build that in, and then the creation of a punch list if there is one, and then an inspection at final completion to verify that everything meets the standards or if there are any remaining issues, something on the punch list hasn't been done. And then depending on where you set the bond in terms of the policy amount at one year in terms of the timeline or the LURs with the two years, personally prefer the two years based on prior experience. Um, at some point before that expires, having an inspection at that point um, to ensure that everything that was constructed held up as planned. Um, those are all standard practices in some other towns so we're not creating on the fly here for sure and that's kind of the rough scope of services we'd ask for from an engineer um, it's really just about to ensure that what gets built meets the standards is done appropriately and protects the public interest because if you do at some point take over infrastructure from anybody any anywhere you want to make sure that the taxpayers have been protected in that and that's something is has been done appropriately so they're not paying for fixes almost from the jump. So we're at the front end of the curve, which provides us with an opportunity to better mitigate and shape those results. And so, Mark, the way the land use regulations work, they, we give them this bond amount. They take out this bond and have an engineer do the work in hopes that at the end there's a product the town will take over, correct? Yes, if, yes. That is the that is the hope and the intent. Okay. Um, so is that the applicant's so, intent too, or? So folks are following Salisbury Square project has asked the town to take over their, their <coughs> access road when their project is done. So the conversation is in following the land use regulations. One of the issues is they have to bond to make sure that the work is completed to spec. And that part takes place before the town decides to take it over or not to take it over. So um, that's kind of where we're, where we're at today. Can I make a comment? Or? Yeah. Um, is, this, is it your intent for the town to take over the road, or yes. is that what you're asking? You are asking them. Yeah. Oh, all right. Um, I've been on the DRB in the past week, said that we weren't going to, but I mean, I'm fine with the bond, but I'm really concerned about the Pandora's box you're going to open up. Like, I have six lots on Hargraves. If I bring that, if I do the bond and I bring it up, the town's going to take that, or I have 11 acres on Lodestar Road just outside of the village. If I bring that up to town. Are you, we're going to be setting the precedent. Right. Same thing with Old Farm Road, yeah. too. I mean, we're going to. Well, this is low income housing. 
doesn't. I mean, mine difference. could be too. Well, I mean, but then we would consider I, it, wouldn't we? Like, I, mean, I, I think this is, well, it sounded like Mark had something to say. I'd like to hear from him and then I have a comment. Yeah, so the, it was uh, original, in the original DRB permit in several years ago, it, the RICDC had agreed to, to, to not, you know, the, to, to maintain the old, do their roads, but it changed with their new, when they went back to the DRB, that was removed, Paul. And, you know, the intent here is the, you know, to try to, this is a, this is a PUD development, it's in the high density district. Um, the, the numbers have been put forth to, to Trevor and to the select board um, for for reasons that you know to, to show that it's it sort of it sort of mostly at least in theory pays for itself um, and the uh, you know the project is is solving a dire need for housing uh, in our community um, so it's it's not a you know if if, you know, if if you feel like a project that you're you're working on merits you know similar uh, a similar path, and, and so be it. Go for it. But I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think isolating this one as as a you know saying that you should it shouldn't happen is necessarily the right approach. We we as you know we're in a dire need in our community. We have 200 jobs that we can't fill. Uh, we have people that aren't taking jobs because we don't have the housing. And you know, RACDC's job here uh, in the community is to build these units and. The number of units that are coming into the town as a result of the work that RACDC is doing is 50 plus, and you know we need two times that to to fill the jobs that are needed to support the businesses in our community. And this project is not only is it a project for housing, it is a it's a net zero project. It's 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 it show the state is very interested in what's happening with this project in terms of how it's going to how it's going to be completed. So. I, I, I just I I really want to, and, and Julie can do a much better job at this than I can. But the importance of this project, on so many levels, uh, is it's imperative that it gets done. And it it comes down to uh, there's, there's some sort of partnership with the town that has to be done in order for us to to solve the housing issues. And, it, and this is an example of how we can work together to do that. Okay. You had a comment? Can I oh, just, yeah, I was just going to say that um, the select board um, indicated its support for taking over the roads um, years ago, and RACDC has been developing its plans and communicating with its funders and making its applications for funds um, with all that in mind this whole time. So the, it, it seems like it's pretty late in the game for us to even be deciding like whether we're going to take it over or not. It's it really should be at this point that we will take it over and then we can do the proper steps that have already been laid out um, that that have to do with road adoption. Um, so I, I think that's really, really where we are right now. And I don't think the board's ever taken a formal vote on whether they would or wouldn't I, I, take it I, over. I recall having this discussion years ago. And, and I think saying it came that, up in discussion, but we didn't take a vote. Saying that, that we would take the roads over, or if we went through the rest of the, you know, the formal process. So it just, it just, this is way more mechanical than that, and it's the same for every type of housing proposal, mm -hmm. whether road, regardless of who ends up living in units and that. The process is set up at the sole discretion of the board about whether it may or may not adopt. And the prudent course is to set up what do you need to ensure that whatever gets built when you get to that consideration point is done correctly. And that's sort of the spot we're in. So where do you want to set that amount as part of that process that's already established? It has, and we can talk about the other connotations and the larger pros, cons, and all of that. It's way more mechanical than that. It's the same process for everybody. I just wanted to maybe drag us back to that moment. And then if you want to have a larger conversation about the do we don't we, from a philosophical standpoint, we can do that. But it's about setting a bond amount um, to at least make sure we're protected in the event you do get to a decision point or a future board gets to a decision point and says yay or nay. It's based on what actually was built and how it was built. I would have to do the bond too, even if I wasn't asking for the time to take it over. I don't think you have to make that decision now. 
that your great guarantee you're taking it over. I mean, you've got to look at what the implications are once you start setting that precedent. Uh, this could be pretty significant to the town. That hasn't actually been my understanding. Can I ask Julie a question? Yeah. What, what would it mean if, if the town didn't give you a, a, a guarantee at this point that we're going to take over the, the roads? Well, um, so as you mentioned, we've been talking about this for a long time, and you know, a lot has happened. Uh, the states and the federal, you know, grant makers have given us access to millions of dollars to support this project for the town. Part of that budgeting around that is that this discussion around town road adoption. There was a vote at one point. I can't remember the year even about an intention to do so, provided that we could meet the standards. And that goes into the operating, uh, you know, budgeting around this because this is targeted to low and moderate incomes, meaning that we have to keep it, not just build it for low and moderate incomes, but keep it affordable to low and moderate income people. And that was the discussion originally around the select board, you know, asking, asking the town to consider taking over these roads, what it does best, not what we do best, not what condo associations do best, um, but to take over the roads once we have built them to the town standards and to maintain them so that these, um, these units can remain affordable over time. So that's what this project has been premised on and built on. Um, a long time has gone by and um, my I'll just register one of my big concerns now is that our, you know, we're, we're about to close and we're planning to close in July into this partnership to start the project. And if we don't even know, you know, we need to know from the town's engineer, have a determination, that, yeah, this meets, you know, we agree with you, this meets the town standards or, you know, comments that we can change ahead of time. So I think time is really of the essence right now because the process is, is kind of late in the game. But it means a lot to us, to our funders, to the state who has invested so much into this project and to the town. They ex expect a partnership here. They expect that the town will be involved in some way. And that's been expressed to us in, you know, in writing. And we shared that with the town. I think it is a partnership. You know, We're trying to do the best we can to make these affordable to people who work here, who live here, and, um, and that you know, has required a lot of partnership on, I, I think there's something like 20 funding sources in this project now. It's a very unique project. Um, people from all over the country, all over the world are interested in it because of the microgrid aspects of it. But fundamentally, the microgrid aspects of it are to make this continually affordable. It's not to do something, you know, super spiffy, because uh, it's really hard, but it's to, it's to keep this affordable, to keep it resilient, to make it a kind of a model for the way that we can make and keep homes affordable in our community. But what you need from the town is the bond amount and an engineer to look at your plans. Yeah, because that's we, what you that's need all today. We, we, can't, we, can't, we, can't, we, we can't build, we can't start building. We will hold up the, the closing and the construction start if we can't have a, a determination that they can't, they can't say, yeah, this meets the standards. And, that has been eluding us um, with the you know, difficulty getting the engineers. Now we're kind of like we're backing up against a wall where, yeah, the bond, we can do a bond pretty quickly, but we have closing documentation. We're going to spend the next two months trying to get to closing, and, um, and it's, a, it's a, a slog. So we, we just don't want to, I mean, I understand we have to build it to the standards, but we're asking one, please work with us on this because this is what the town does best, right? And this is a sort of the town's piece of the project when asking for, you know, capital contributions, although the state, some of the state did ask if the town would contribute capital. We said, no, we don't think that's possible. But they will consider taking over the roads. So this is what we're asking. Please consider taking over these roads. Please help us get to the point where we can make that determination and please help us get to closing so we can start this project and get those. But you can go to closing with mm -hmm. a bond amount and an engineer. You can go to Signing closing. Signing off that these are the, the towns. And, and then 
hopefully an expression of intent that if we go through this, because we're going to be spending money on the bond, spending money on the engineer, your engineer, I'd like an expression of intent that, yeah, if, if, all, if we can meet those standards, which our engineer thinks we do, do already, then the intent is that we go ahead and we adopt this road and we build it to the standards, have the engineer come, inspect, and, um, and we all end up, you know, at the end of the project with a brand spiffy new road and a bunch of housing. So, but if there was already a vote, why are you here asking them to take it over? There was a vote last year by the select board. No, that was a, last year. It was a lot. It was years ago. It was a while. It was, it was, it was, it was an attempt. Not long after I got on the board. Oh, okay. We didn't I actually have to take it over, though. Okay. It wasn't the conversation. We didn't the conversation the conversation there, was no plan, there was no plan to take over at that point. Okay. Now we have plans. Why are you asking? No, there was no, there we could, there were no plans. There was a concept at the time. Right. And there's been multiple concepts right. since then. And now we have actual plans, actual funding in place. But so, but the highway, the engineers haven't looked at it for the town, and the highway manager hasn't looked at it, correct? At the plans. Last time you said he did, but I looked at it, and what he looked at was whether you could have a curb cut. I, I can only tell you this. I have provided to the town everything that they needed to review this. I I filled out the paperwork for the road review because Mark suggested I do that at the same time that we went to the DRB back in um, November of last year. We have provided everything. Whether that has been reviewed, I cannot say, except that I've heard that it was. I, you know, again, I, I am not, nobody asked me to come to a meeting and review this with them. I know that I've supplied the town with everything that I've been asked to supply necessary to review those plans. We've made our engineers available to have discussions with people, which we did during the DRB process. I can't tell you exactly who has reviewed what, when, with whom. Unfortunately, the DRB process is different, but... But the road um, application, I think, is... Okay, so the item we were asked about to put on the agenda for tonight is the bond and an engineer, a town engineer. Those are the two topics that we have before us. And Trevor's still working on a quote for the engineer, and I don't think the board has to take action on that. That's just him giving you a number to include in your bid documents. What the board has to decide tonight is how much that bond is for. And we know that the construction is a million, and if we add the 15 to it, it's a million two sixty-five. It looks to me like it's pretty laid out in the land use regulations what that contingency amount is that we added in there. So we just need a motion to approve that bond number and to allow Trevor to give them a number for the engineer. I think it's a million two sixty-five, and we go for the two years after construction. It's in the land use regulations on that. So we can make a motion based off that information? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's a motion to approve. To set the construction model. You go for it, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to find one. But it wouldn't be this, right? It would be at the estimated construction cost plus the contingency? Yes, it's all 65. Um, 1,265,000. Um, the construction bond shall be in effect until a date one year later, two to two years later, than any date of adoption. And the engineer cost? Um, and the um, engineering cost will be covered by RAC. Right. Did you say date of adoption or date of construction? Date of construction. Date of construction. Date of construction. Thank you. <laughs> when the construction is complete. Date of completion of construction. Constructing this is Sorry, real. Judy. <laughs> How are you doing for you? <laughs> <laughs> second. The motion and the second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed?
seminaries. And I'd, I'd like to, to continue the conversation around adopting the road. I, I think we really ought to adopt this road, I think. We can't I, adopt it. We don't have anything to adopt not yet. Not right now. Not right yeah. now. We will adopt this road. Um, I think for the reason that, that Julie made really clear that it's, it's been part of their plan all along. Millions of dollars are coming into the town to create this development. Um, the town of Randolph, I don't think we've spent anything um, to support this development. Um, it makes us a good partner in the eyes of all the folks who are giving out these. We don't spend anything on any development, though. That's not what we do. That's not Our whole thing is to make sure this is built right, regardless of who builds it. That's the process that's here. You can't take over hypothetical infrastructure I'm, and still say that we are comporting by best practice. You're not, you're not letting this has come up every time. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not done. I would love to be able to, I'd like to be able to finish my thought. And if my thought doesn't make sense, I can own that too. I would just like us to express our intent to take this road over, assuming that it's built to the proper specifications, that everything's done the way it's supposed to be, going along with our land use regulations and whatever other regulations that need to be adhered to, that when everybody does what they say they're going to do and they do it in the right way, that we're saying that, yeah, if everybody does what they're going to say they're going to do and it's all done the right way, that we will adopt these roads. So that, that RACDC has this assurance that, that that will happen, as I really do believe has been the intention of the town all along. I don't know that we can do that. Because we're tying the hands of the board that's got to decide whether to adopt it or not. What happens if it's a fiasco? <laughs> And it's a fiasco. Right. Then it's and then it's not going to then it's then it's mm -hmm. not going to meet the the rules that right, the that it goes through. And you you can bring it into spec, but you know you've got a lot of risk going forward. Mm -hmm. still gonna, we're going to tie their hands, so they got to adopt it. I don't see why the, the whole idea of meeting all those standards is that it minimizes that risk. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. No. Have you looked at the standards? The standards are to handle a certain weight capacity certain width, a certain depth, a certain sub-base, right? So now you have, you get into your construction and you find a sinkhole or you find poor soils and it's outside of your spec. We don't have anything in the spec that says you gotta do anything along that. We don't have anything in the spec that says how much of that infrastructure we're gonna take on. Right? There's all kinds of variables in there. Well, it seems like we, we should try to figure out a, a way that we can come to an understanding of what that might be. And maybe if there's, if there's parts that pop up, they can, they can be included. But it just seems like we're, that we, 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 we did make this this intention years ago, I, I just think we, we should be following through on it. So you guys have it, you voted on it just a couple years ago. It was all different. Yeah, like, that's what I mean. That's, it's I not, know that we, then there's no intent. No. It is. Can I make a quick comment? I, and I'll be the same person, I'll put my foot in my mouth if I want to. I just want the town to be aware of what you're doing. I'm 110% for your project. I bet. No, I think it's great. I spent a long time in coming. Whatever support you folks need. My concern is, is the town taking over roads when they're already having difficulty in taking care of what they've got. We don't have the manpower. It's really a challenge if you live outside. And what you're basically a asking for is the taxpayers to pay for it, for the plowing and the sanding of it. And you folks are getting grants and federal funding and stuff like that. You, you, your budgets don't reflect that your costs are going to be lower from that. From my standpoint, it would be all out of my pocket. I'm not a nonprofit, you know, where you folks are able to get grants and stuff like that. So it, it's you're putting it on the taxpayers to pay for this. And for us, the, the, the folks who own the buildings are going to be taxpayers. I, 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 I get that. I'm not saying no. All I'm saying is you've got to think about it because there could be a number of people that come to you that build their roads. To town road specs, and once you set that precedent, 
you've opened up Pandora's box. I, I don't care who it is. I think the, the playing level should be even for everybody. I don't care if you're a nonprofit, if you're a developer, everybody should be treated the same. And once we do that, you know, we're, if you really want to be that consistent, though, you can point to all the developments that have happened in the last hundred years that the town maintains and say, why do these people get their roads? Well, up? hold on. We did away with yeah. some of those roads, correct? So, I'm, just, so. I'm just saying, it's, it's really, precedent is not what I think is important here. I think we it take these the projects point. on on a case-by-case -case basis and decide what is best for the town. I would agree. And we're making it affordable for those folks, but we're not making it affordable for the other taxpayers in the village district or in town. We're, I, mean, I understand we're bringing in a lot my, of money. My understanding stuff. is that the, the, the amount of property taxes developed by this dense development is going to be more than what it's going to cost to maintain it. Well, I understand that. That's, yeah, that's so it's a net win for the town, property tax-wise, if we were to maintain the roads. Well, but the, we could look at that from other perspectives. That's a terrible way to look at yeah, it. It is horrible. I've never heard of such a thing. Are we going to maintain the uh, hotels? I mean, happy to have do that. <laughs> and we're going to get a net gain, right? The amount of taxes they're going to pay to what it'll yeah, cost us really... to maintain it. I mean, that's not a way to look at it. You're right. This is, a, this, is a res, this is a you can't residential say you're development. It's different. Well, so it's, it's different it's, stuff. It's on existing it's different. taxpayers. Existing taxpayers, yes. But the the extra costs will be covered by the new taxpayers. So existing taxpayers are not going to feel a difference on this. But if I built my development out, I have six lots on hard race. Those people are paying taxes, but I'm not asking the town to take it over. And if they do, I mean that would be great. I mean. Right. I hope they, I mean, I guess my goal is, yeah, let's take it over. I live on the street that gets plowed, and my sidewalk gets it's plowed. It's not as easy as we think it is. And, you know, I'm really glad that I do that, that, that it's done for me. Um, I pay taxes, but there are people who pay taxes that don't have their driveways plowed, and I mean, their, their roads plowed. So, I mean, I'm not sure that I, I mean, like again, I think I'm not sure that, that this conversation. I'm not sure this conversation is that, that it doesn't need to happen because you don't have to commit to doing the road, taking over the road. You've already done what you needed to. May I? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think we may be missing a larger point, um, which is that this is different because there's no way that this could happen with any private wealth like this is we're we're trying to reach a population that isn't being reached that's why there are these programs like missing middle and the home program and the tax credits that are funding this because it's not going to happen otherwise all these funders all these private and public funders have come together to help the town provide housing for people that it needs to work in its factories and stores and things and live here and commit and invest here that otherwise could not do that because the homes are too expensive, the rentals are too expensive for whatever point they're at. The state, the feds are willing to invest in this with the town, but they do kind of expect that the town will be there investing with them it's not like a private development. It is a partnership. And there have been many examples of this town and lots of other towns taking advantage of the fact that, yeah, to make something happen, you've got to participate. That's what happened with the DNK building. That's what happened with you know a lot of other examples in town. This won't happen otherwise. This is not a market situation. This is not like the floor has, you know, it's not like a, if I'm a private developer and I go, you know, expecting it, this is different. And the only way that this is going to get done is if people hold hands and, and sort of join in that together. And we've got 20 or more funders who have already said yes because they believe in this project and they believe in this town. And they believe that people in this town who don't make enough to buy a house at market value should still be able to live here. And that's why we're doing it. And that's why we're asking for help. Not because we want to change a precedent. This is different. But it's not. Really. It's so just nobody's no, saying they don't different. support the project. Mm -hmm. The problem is a town policy can't be directed towards a certain income individual or a certain race or a certain sex or a certain anything. 
It has to be a policy that's town-wide. But fine, let so, me give you a reason why this meets that town-wide policy. But the question that's been raised that's being discussed is, if you're going to do it there, if I build my houses over here and I put the road to it to the spec, is the town going to take that over too? And the answer is, if we do one, we probably got to look at all of them. Well, you look at you're know, looking at the criteria, all the criteria of which we have, you know, it's in the it's in the neighborhood development area. It meets the state standards That's for not that. Part of our road criteria, and when we do and don't take them over, the dense development areas. These, if they they are in our town plan as goals. Your other policy should support those goals. That's what we're trying to do here. We're, we're checking off almost every box from brownfields to dense development to low to moderate income. I mean, this is an opportunity for the town to collaborate with all these other funders to try to make this affordable. It has been expressed in the past over many conversations that the town is willing to at least consider doing this before we had conceptual plans or, or final plans. We have final plans now. We're just asking you to like go forward and at least try to hold hands and say, yeah, our intent is to go forward with this provided that you meet these standards. We've already built those standards into our plans. It's not like we ignored the standards. We've hired engineers. We've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars getting to this point, and we are asking the town to, yes, do something to partner with us in this effort. And I, I might be mistaken, but I, I took your point earlier, Trini, about the things which could go wrong. So I, certainly that's a possibility and something that we should, you know, be thinking about as we do any road adoption. Um, but if we express our intent, we're not binding ourselves to anything. We're just saying that, assuming that things go as everybody kind of expects them to go, that we're going to take over the road. If something horrible happened, still met our specs, but something unexpected happened that caused us to be like, oh my gosh, this would actually be a really bad idea, then we wouldn't be bound to still do it. But we have done that, right? By setting, we've taken the next step in the process by setting the bond amount and hiring an engineer to do the functions that need to be done for the town. So we've then, continued so. on that journey and we've gone to this next step. So if that's the case, then it wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt to just formally express that we're, we're, we're thinking that at the end of this, we're, we're going to take it over and just make that a, you've already a, done state, that with a your statement, vote. statement of the board. We've done that with the vote of setting a bond value. It I would want the time to write that so it wasn't coming back as a as a, well, look, you took this vote and now you're stuck with it. Versus just a <laughs> off the cuff thing. That, so, that makes me nervous. Actually, would such a statement be still helpful for you if we had one ready for you at our next meeting? I mean, it, I think anything helps that gives us reassurance, that gives our funders reassurance, that gets us to closing in time. We are just facing so many deadlines right now and it would be a shame if, you know, what's the old saying, for want of a, <laughs> what is but that old saying? it's not a requirement for, for the funding, right? There's nothing mandated in any of the grant applications. You've got an email from a state employee in Commerce that says they'd like to see it. That but it's from, not a grant. That was from a multi-agency roundtable discussion about the project where they express a strong interest in seeing towns participate in these kind of projects when they fund them, yes. Um, and there's no funder mandate that the town do this, but there is a budget that is potentially broken by the town not helping us in this way. Which yeah. budget? For the construction? The operating budget ongoing operating budget. We can cover, we have built in the cost of construction. We will pay for your engineer. We will pay for the bond. But you're asking us to pay that in advance. We really know, and we'd like some reassurance that if we go through this and we do all that, 
Yeah. We're going to get to the about 50 permit. I'm looking for Trevor. Hey, Trevor. Yep. Yeah. Is there? Is there? Is there? A, we're 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 sort of, we're sort of stuck on this idea that we don't want to bind ourselves to something that that we that puts us at that puts the town at risk. I have a is there? Is there is there something is there a way that you would recommend wording this? If, if maybe if it maybe intent isn't the right word, maybe there's some other word that we can express our lack of a better word intent without. Can I making just a, say something? Let me just get to try. I know, but I can solve the, what's coming out of your mouth right now. I hear two words interchangeably: consider and intent. Those are the two words. You can consider, but don't make the intent. Well, that's why I, I asked Trevor, Trevor, from the Trevor, Trevor has a lot more experience with municipal contracts, and so he'll have a much better sense of, he'll have, the, I think, the best sense of anybody in the room of what will adequately convey what I'm trying to say in a way that will be okay with the town. I'm just trying to clarify, what we're trying to say is that we want to signal an intention to move to an outcome? I'm just trying to follow the conversation. I'm trying to make sure I understand what we're trying to say. Yeah. We want to say that we'll consider taking over the road, or that we intend to take over the road without committing ourselves to taking over the road. I think it's that we're going to con continue down the path of that's outlined. Right? Like the, the process, and the, we expect we expect to take over the roads. We don't know for sure that it's going to happen. Maybe there's going to be some really unusual, unforeseen event that would cause us to back away from what we would like to do. But that at at, at the end of this process, that we're expecting that we're going to be adopting the road. I have a question. Okay. I think it might be more about. Describing the process, how it puts you on a path toward that consideration, and how if everything is done according to specifications, meets the policy, you, you're in a place to make that decision. I, I, I'm just wrestling a little bit with the, we are, but we may not, how to reconcile those two elements, Yeah. if that makes any sense. I think, I think we can certainly describe the process, that this is a pathway toward that, that it would be queued up if everything goes well, and the board at that point has a decision to make. Um, short of some sort of policy decision or, or statement of intent, basically, that would, that would word that differently. But um, otherwise, you are effectively binding future board's hands. If, if it is, hey, we are going to take this over at the end, based on the current structure. We don't have some of the structures in place that they have in other larger municipalities where you, you might have a pathway laid out on the front end. Um, but that's something we can consider for the future, but doesn't help us, obviously, in the here and now. So. Okay, Molly had a question. Uh, well, I have two questions. This isn't on the agenda, so we can't really it, it's part of our Salisbury Square discussion. But that was what was. That's what's on the agenda. The Salisbury Square is, but not the road. It, it's only the bond that we've been asked mm -hmm. to make a. You I, know. I think the agenda just yeah. says Salisbury Square discussion. Yeah. It does, but there were people that wanted to come if we were going to adopt the road that didn't come. And because it was supposed to be the bond and engineer. Yeah. And but that's not what it says. And it's, the construction's going to move forward whether or not we make a decision on the road tonight, right? Everything will keep going. We were just really asked about the bond and the engineer. Everything else will keep moving. So even if we don't come up with something tonight, you can keep moving forward, correct? Because it seems like we're just going round and round in circles, and we're not really getting anywhere, and people are just saying the same thing over and over again, and we've got... A, an agenda ahead of us. So if they can keep going with their construction, can, can't can we circle back to this when we have maybe a better outline? 
or a better view of really the roads or, you know, can you can keep going, finishing? correct? Yes, they can keep moving. Okay. I hope so. Create a speed bump. Can I just say something? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, Trevor, did you express, express that this is how old of a policy? 30 something plus years? Yeah, the road adoption policy is 28 years old. Okay, 28 years old. So, it seems to me that going forward, being a past select board member in this situation never really came up, but I kind of knew about Julie's intent here, that it seems like probably now is an appropriate time to think about adopting a new road adoption policy, okay, that looks at all the economic benefits and all those other risks that you have to take in order to get to a position where a future board is able to make a decision based on the criteria that's been set, not some whim or, you know, potential association with any particular entity in the community. So in my mind, I'm not sure who needs to develop that policy, whether it's you, whether it comes from you know, a, a collaborative effort between the Economic Development Committee or whether there's an, an Economic Development Committee at this point, but you know, the Planning Commission and those people, I think, need to weigh in on how this could benefit the community going forward because you have multiple projects in the community that no one ever adopted their road. I mean, Sugar Plum Court, we don't plow that, to the best of my knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was my phone call to Trini to, to, that you guys, when I first came, okay? I wanted to know, do we plow Sugar, plow Sugar Plum Court? We don't. And there's other projects in town we do, and there's other places we don't. But, you know, a number of years ago, we eliminated a lot of roads that we were plowing that didn't have any major benefit to those of us in the community who were taxpayers. So now, I think here's a good opportunity to kind of put a, a, a line in the sand that says, if your project does this, which Julie's project does do, I mean, there's, there's going to be economic benefit to that project, okay? And it's going to serve some needs. And to Mark's point, you know, if we're 200 houses in the hole here, okay, then we need to find, you know, other avenues. And this is why Larry's comment about the state mandating how dense the district should be is part of this process. So going forward, hypothetically, now you're telling me that we can do a eight, what did you say, 5,000 square feet per lot? Well, I guess I could put 48 houses up at Fires Hill, so I can guarantee you I'm going to come ask you if, we can put, if you guys will take over the road. So therefore, I think you need some policies in place as this goes forward, because as soon as you pass that 5,000 square foot lie, you're going to have more of these kind of things come to your plate. So that's all I got to say. That's a good point. Thank you, Perry. You're welcome. Great. Can we beat this one enough? I never heard of that. <laughs> 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 nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. Public assembly permit and fan replacement. This is the And you guys get to weigh in on it too, you know. <laughs> yeah. I forgot to mention you. Thank you for that. UTB agreement and trailer purchase proposal. Came back. Yes. We're in every crowd. <laughs> All right. So let's Try to put it up on the screen because of cool co voice. I might be able to screen share. Yeah, that might be better than on my phone. I literally raced into town for one Newport meeting. Oh, that's exciting. I was like, oh, I must have a way to handle this. <laughs> I'm not going to make it home. I'm going to move over to Zoom in like three minutes. Mm -hmm. right. Running away? Yes. Check with him a little bit. He's had enough of being alone. So I'll mm -hmm. be right on Zoom. <laughs> All right. So. Um, Looks like it's up on the screen. Yeah. Do you, you want me to go through it or? Sure. Okay. So this is going back to the original conversation related to acceptance. 
there was always envision that we'd have some kind of agreement in place governing use. It's written up as an MOU in this case, um, just as a format. We could always change the title. Um, but this matches the format of agreement. I've used uh, other places. We used this way back in May at six days. Um, when the town in Zen Village bought a, a ladder truck together between the two departments. That became the governing document for both the purchase and all of the use training, storage, all of those things. So just sort of modeling this on that agreement, which worked fairly well in practice. It would be an agreement between the town of Randolph and the um, fire departments. I describe it here as the nonprofit auxiliary organization. I'm guessing, I think I saw Mike and Wayne in the audience. You know, it might have a more formal name or a different name. I couldn't find one in a quick search on the nonprofit databases, so I just wrote it up like this and put a note that we want to make sure we get that one right. Recognized nonprofit. Or VFD Inc. <coughs> or R V F D L C. I'll get I'll get you the wording. Yeah. Because it doesn't come up on the Secretary of State site at all. Oh, they are registered. Okay. So. But it may be because we didn't yeah. refer initials. Yeah, it's not written that, up yeah, it's R V F D. Yeah, I don't think I looked for initials. I think I just did combinations of fire and, and, and village and other colors. Um So yeah, we just need to make sure we get that. So that it starts with just the purpose. Um, it's about accepting the donation, making sure the equipment's used in a safe, responsible, and effective manner. It specifies that we're talking about the UTV, any equipment or tools or attachments that are on it, and then the trailer that's been talked about as a potential future ad to get it to and from the site. The definitions are fairly standard here. Just describe who everyone is. Again, the BFD one refers, we just have to get that name to match there. And then in the UTV one, I just, I didn't have it in my notes, but the make model year, all of that information as to the unit. Um, so we can refer to it specifically. So that's why that section right there is highlighted. Um, ownership just reviews board accepted it um, and then also specifies we talked way back then about uh, making sure that it's housed operated from essentially the UTV lives and is used by village fire so that's where this section 3536 those lines tries to cover that and then we get into the operations and this was pulled from a variety of sources from uh, various loss control recommendations uh, guidelines in use in other municipalities, not just uh, in Vermont, actually primarily out west, there seem to be more examples of um, fire districts, county fire, those types of entities that had these pieces of equipment and had some rules or, or guidelines for use. So we put those in there. I would admit Stephanie there. Um, so in the operations section, it first essentially goes through the UTV itself. So some of the provisions that are in here, just to go through them quickly, I won't read them all to everybody, but just kind of go through um, in summary form what they are. That UTV is operated in accordance with the rules established, that if we get outside the rules, um, it could be in, um, in some violation of agreement and might result in other actions, and you'll see there's a section for that later. Um, and then try to put in a little provision that if we've got to do something that's outside of this spectrum, there's some way to clear it. Right now it says the manager and the chair of the board are kind of the one and two, just in that chain. Um, so that's just something to, to keep in mind and consider, I'm trying to cover enough of our bases in this, but at the same time recognize that with a new piece of equipment, there's always stuff that comes up um, that, that we haven't predicted here that we may need to respond to. Um, second one is one we've talked about a few times. It's got to be used for emergency, public safety, or municipal purposes. Any other use is prohibited. It refers to uh, suspension of use, which is in a later section. We'll get to that down below. Under seeds, just about how all users, in this case, users, anybody who's going to operate um, the UTV, uh, what they'll have to abide by. There's a $35 course that's Vermont State Police endorsed. It's largely done online. You get a certificate, essentially, um, at the end of it. Uh, the picture they showed looks a little bit like a like a driver's license or a little insurance card. And so what this these few sections through here all go through is that any user has to complete that course, uh, provide the town with a copy of their user certificate, but to make sure they have a valid Vermont driver's license um, that they're over the age of 21. Uh, that's more of a loss control consideration, but we can certainly discuss 
I mean, we've got firefighters that might be younger than that. That's a problem. Um, and then in here, one of the things I've highlighted is a policy question because this is sort of a new arrangement. This has the auxiliary or the nonprofit paying for the course per person. I mean, it could come out of the general fund budget, you know, the operating lines as a training expense. Nobody really cares. We can do it one way or the other. It's just written up this way to start the conversation. So however you want to land on that, we can do that. You see there's a later comment, same question, um, about properly fitted helmets, personal protective equipment, um, the use of seat belts or other restraints while the UTV is being operated, make sure that there aren't more passengers than seat belts or restraints. Um, I'm trying to cover both anybody who is operating and if somebody's involved in a rescue situation, loads have to be balanced to avoid tipping hazards, um, operating at safe speed at all times, uh, adhering to weight limits. Um, there is a little provision in G about if there's a firefighter from another department who's active in good standing, has completed all of the training that the VFD folks are going through, um, and it works out. Um, they might be able to use that, but trying to put some guardrails in terms of as long as you're doing everything else, everyone else is required to do, and the equipment's available, and there's a situation essentially. And then going back to the loss control um, recommendations that'll come as part of our every year inspections. The loading and transportation piece gets a little bit more into the to the trailer. Um, and just UTV only transport on the assigned trailer. That was, I think, talked about uh, in some form at the last meeting. Um, used behind an authorized and appropriate vehicle. And this gets into, you see there's a highlight comment down below. How do we transport the trailer in the UTV? Uh, we talked about the use of certain um, town highway vehicles. Um, but what if those aren't available? Um, sort of what are the, the measures? And probably some sort of protocol for access to that just so everybody knows when, knows how, knows where, all of those pieces. Don't know if that needs to be in the agreement, but that's something that should be worked out ahead of time. Um, so that departments don't go looking for equipment and find it's not there, and conversely that the fire department doesn't go looking for something to tow the, the UTV and trailer and find out it's not there. Um, any damage to those town vehicles um, not otherwise covered by insurance would be the responsibility of of the auxiliary is in here. Um, see, these comments are about the availability of trucks to haul. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Properly connected to a hitch, safe speeds, secured at all times, a spotter with loading and unloading, and then the loss control language. Um, and again, much like with the courses and some of the other stuff, and hearkening all the way back to the original conversation on acceptance, maintenance, and replacement are are both in the same framework. This version of the agreement puts the responsibility for maintenance back on the nonprofit association um, and then sort of specifies um, maintenance practices. I put it in there so it matches all of the other provisions of this agreement. If through this conversation you want to change any of these things, we swap the language out, but it gives us a starting spot. Replacement, much like was said at the time. There's no obligation for the town after acceptance or even with this MOU to replace the UTV, trailer equipment, other accessories through use of town general fund. Um, doesn't mean that you couldn't make that determination if asked or if um, you know, something changes in the future. It just means that there's no um, presumed standard related to that. Um, Non-compliance, um, that's just if for any reason the, the agreement's violated. Um, somebody's pulling up its behind a private vehicle and driving 80 miles an hour down A Street. Um, you know, that's that's a violation of the terms of the screen and would result in a, in a suspension of use. Uh, and then the term just goes with the life of the UTV or trailer um, and tries to stay real specific to those pieces of equipment. So that's the quick rundown of this very um, exciting piece of literature. Trevor, when we look at this, is it, um, just thinking out loud, isn't it two documents that we need? One is the agreement that the town will have with the nonprofit, and the other one is like a policy for the actual department members. 
Because right, in one case yeah. they're a nonprofit, in another place they're a town department. Right. They're they're probably and correct me if I'm wrong. I can see the guys kind of in the background. There there is a, a policy best practices book that's already in place that would probably be a good spot to stick a sort of the departmental policy on use. Because the, the nonprofit won't be the one responsible for the use of the equipment, if I understand correctly. They raised the money, bought it. Their intent is to turn it over to the town, at which point it becomes a town piece of equipment operated by paid firefighters. It, yeah, some of the operating framework is covered in the agreement, and, you know, such as the use of PPE, the loading, the um, spotter on and off. So some of those that might otherwise appear in policy are in this. So it's either duplication or, or splitting them out, um, depending on how we want to structure this. It's a three-way agreement. Yeah, and it could even be that we got another category and, and can even specify. So in this section that I've got pulled up on the screen, we look at lines 47 through, say, 63. We change the reference so that it's to the fire department since they're the ones that are going to be using it. The town will own it. Um, but say the maintenance pieces, if they stay the same in terms of who's responsible, that could stay listed. You know, at the nonprofits for that. So some of it could even just be adding the third entity and then amending, you know, making sure some of these sections clearly draw lines between them. The intent of turning it over to the town was because you were having trouble getting insurance and those type of things, or what was, was the actual intent? The intent was that it would become a department piece of equipment and that it would be insured by the town as such, similar to it be like our fire trucks, et cetera, our equipment. And so that way, you know, we wouldn't have to put it into our budget. It supplements our fire services uh, capabilities and becomes a town piece of equipment like the rest of our stuff. Mm -hmm. Which this is doing. But, um, <coughs> but wasn't there a piece that would only be village members that operated it you didn't want it going out to be used for anything else right wasn't there not, not necessarily that? like if the, we didn't want it loaned to the rec department right unless it was a fire department person going with them because if we had a call that needed it we didn't want to have to go find it and so it was just that it would be operated by the fire department um, and therefore if, if somebody else wanted to like somebody couldn't just request it and use it on their own right because you're asking us to go through this training we're willing to go through the training, but if we have a call, we want to be able to say, yep, we have it, let's go. So if Randolph Center had a call and needed it and had been through the training, they could come get it. And yeah, they have a key to our fire station. Scene. But we do, we do have pieces of that in this draft. I've highlighted the one where we're housing it and operating it from, unless there's some other set of circumstances that weren't. And then there's under operations, there is that piece that gets to that example you gave. Um, and we can always beef these up, change these, do whatever folks want to do, but um, any other firefighter active in a good standing, different department, as long as they've had the training and do so in accordance with the with the agreement. There are at least the beginnings of those pieces right here. So tagging on your question before, I don't think that should be in the MOU. I think how we operate our fire department because you're asking me to main, operate a UTV stricter than I do a $700,000 pumper and you trust me with that, add to that my responsibilities as the chief to make sure that the people are trained and safely operating this equipment to the best of my ability. Well, this agreement is ownership. So right? um, the risk management folks when you go to insure these are, are controlling a lot of this. No, I understand that. So they want to see it segregated. They want to see a very strict document that outlines training outlines. No, and I'm, all that and I'm okay with that. But the document he referenced, best management practices, and our combined 65 years, I've never seen that document. I don't know what he's talking about for best management practices for fire services. Never seen it. 
These are coming, most of these are coming out of conversations with. Oh, I thought you were referencing a town policy that was governing the fire departments. No? Am no, I correct? We, no. We talked about right. No, I Remember the manual that we worked on for. That's what November? I was talking about. Oh, okay. That's the, what he's talking about. The in process one. The, <laughs> the one that we added the junior firefighter yes. to and okay. all that. That's the document he's talking about. All right. Like, should a policy about training and operations be added to that? It, so this is a first draft. We're trying to get our head around everything that came in from all these and figure out how we put it into play. And so this was the first format. But, you know, we've got, you got a town department, right, the fire department, but then you've got this nonprofit that plays a role out there. And then you got the town, and some things are policy on kind of when you operate, how you operate it. So those don't really go so much in an MOU unless it's going to be a. You know, right. And you usually don't have a town have an MOU with one of their departments. You know, we wouldn't have an MOU with a rec department or whatnot. So it's kind of an awkward scenario, but we wanted to capture everything to make sure we don't miss anything and that's pretty much what this is and so when you look at what other people have for policies and what the league come in with make sure you do this this and this that's kind of what this is and that was why the comment about should some of this be policy versus be in an MOU and that's what I would see and that's in what a, we're trying to break out policy. here is kind of what what goes where yeah, we're not adopting this or doing anything with it. This is awareness and to kick the conversation out and see if the board has anything else they think ought to be in there. Or, and then it'll, the draft will come your way. And right now it looks like we got to break it out into two, two pieces that recognize. And some of it's going to be defining what is that relationship? What is the relationship the nonprofit has in, in these assets? And, how does that work? So, what do you, what do you, what are you going to be responsible for as the nonprofit, and what are you going to be responsible for as the fire department? Yep. Is there anything that's not in this that was expected? Can I? I, there's something in there that I'd like to add since you asked that question. Yeah. We would like to include the trailer. I guess there was a question about whether we could buy it and, re and immediately put it in the town's ownership. That is possible as long as we don't finance it. If we pay 100%, they'll That's just put it right in there. They don't care who writes the check. They just. Okay. Yeah, I think we were looking at that from the if you had to register it as the nonprofit and pay it. And go through that and then we register it as we the town to. if you went to transfer. Okay. I talked to uh, Big Techs this morning and they, and they confirmed. Okay. Um, we got more work to do on this for sure. Yeah, Stay expected, but we were just trying to start some of the issues. Okay. Good with that, Trevor. With which piece? I'm sorry. Um, that we're going to separate it out, what goes into a policy and what's actually an agreement with the nonprofit. Do you want me to try to do that or? Yeah, we'll try to be mindful of everybody's preferred methodology. Um, yes, we can actually get a game plan on that tomorrow. Let me touch base on the Army Corps demands. Alright, sounds good. Okay. We will try to separate those two into two documents and then send them out in drafts. Okay. So they're more in kind of the format that are going to end up in. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, adopting the local emergency management plan. I did not look at this. 
quite honest with you. I totally ran out of time. So, uh, is there a penalty for us adopting this later, or, or is that just a Two Rivers email that comes out every couple weeks to say we haven't got it's, it yet? My understanding is it's tied to the ERAF percentages. So, if there's a gap between May 1 and whenever we adopt and something happens, we'd be at a lower ERAF percentages percentage in an emergency scenario where we ended up in a reimbursement cycle. Okay. That's, so that, that's the, the penalty if um, there is one, it's just that lower percentage. I don't have the number off the top of my head, I forget. Came out at one I think it's a couple, per, couple percentage points. And so um, usually it's just points of contact, right? Well, most of the updates were to, to the contacts and just making sure we had them them right. They wanted us to also make sure that we indicated the sites had heating and cooling, which we had done last year as well. Um, you see that version there are highlights over over those, but there weren't any other operating changes. It was really just changes in contact and making sure the numbers and and such were right. But we can readopt it right at any time. We can have. Right. We can adopt this version, and then next month, if somebody sees something they want to change, we can change it and readopt it, right? Absolutely. I don't want to leave people at risk on um, reimbursements. So. Did anybody see anything major that they wanted to change before we adopted? This is not, I'm on page five, and I don't see anything glaring yet. For those of you wanting to like really understand what this is, all it is is basically a list of resources and contacts if there's anything major that happens. So this is where we like put somebody's phone number in wrong or name in or something, but most times it doesn't change. It's all the same. If we don't see any changes or anything big we want to do. Anybody want to make a motion to accept it? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Also, I'm looking at it, Judy, I promise. I'll go over it again, too. It was pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, NEP DEP ARPA grant draft amendment. Looks like maybe Mark has jumped back on. Um, there was some talk at the last meeting about additional amendments that might come, and so we would wait and see if we could sweep them all up in one. Those haven't arrived, and the only potential addition is the language that we suggested. Um, just to make sure that we're in the notice protocol should there be an issue with the system, such as the pretreatment system fails, um, creates a potential alleged violation of our wastewater system if it's not known by us in terms of our metal loads are out of compliance. Uh, just making sure that when they notify the state, it's, it's we're somewhere in there too, certainly Chris and his group. Any questions on that? Any motions? So moved. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Consider approving grant applications. <coughs> There are two different categories in this case. It's the COPS grant that we talked about throughout the budget process. This would be the, if we're one of the two additional ones, um, the deadline was earlier this month, so we put the application in, thinking that we would ask for permission later and or beg forgiveness. If we get it, you don't want to accept it, we certainly don't have to. Um, so that was for the full request there, which would be a three-year grant to help us fund one of the officers, and the other grants were of the miscellaneous set of Governor's Highway Safety Program grants. So that's everything from targeted DUI patrols to speed patrols to 
education pieces. So there are a few different components to that. We've got an active set now. They're well managed. They've been a nice source of revenue. They've been a nice source of um, community service too, in terms of how we've been able to, to to take on different activities. So those are the two categories of grant applications we're seeking permission for. Albeit in each case, deadlines were in between meetings, so it's admittedly after the fact. So when you see your monthly statistics and it says grant, that's the grants that are paying for the speed patrol and stuff like that. Governor's Highway ones. Anybody want to approve those applications? I'll move that we approve So them. moved. <laughs> that sounded like a second. To me. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Consider whether or not to accept a CDBG grant for the North Wells Reservoir Project. In short, this is a complicated funding stack with multiple funders, multiple sources. I've laid out in the table for you that we're actually $125,000 to the good in terms of we've got more money available to us from that funding stack than we need for the project. The project is only a couple of months out from completion. Everything is still on schedule. So the, well, the potential, potential for variables exists. It is significantly lower than it would have been, say, a year ago. So this is a grant we don't need. It would add complication that would not necessarily be helpful. Um, and so really the request is to decline the award and this award was made years ago. What's changed since then are the amount of subsidies that we've received um, as part of our loan application, and then also the federal earmark received through Senator Sanders' office. That's how we made up what otherwise would have been that difference. That's the short version of the story. So Trevor, this, this grant would be unable to be used for paying off any debt that we have on this project? I mean, if we put it into the stack and we used it and we potentially borrow less than what, I mean, maybe it could reduce in some way, but um, I don't think anything significantly. The other sources cover everything that's already in place. And we've already paid sort of our own match. Um, and the CDBG funds have their own strings complications. And if there are essentially pre-construction conditions that are now required given the time lapse, that ship has already sailed. Mm. Uh, we are nearly done. Right. So that, there's that set of complications. The, I talked to someone, I, was, I have a regular meeting with someone in the drinking water division, and they thought this was pretty appropriate given the fact that we had the funding available, um, where we were in the project point, and some of the process elements that CDBG funds could add. OK. Just, it feels weird to be giving back money, but it sounds like it makes sense. Yeah, there's n nothing we can do to shift it to other needs. First. You're oh. muted. You're still muted. <laughs> Sorry, I'm only 45 years short on my experience. Um, yeah, I don't know that we can reconfigure it. I don't know if we've got a water supply project that would fit, and that was essentially the category of award. So but we could certainly ask. There's a meeting scheduled. Mark and I have, I think, the week after next with Julia, um, who works for the state agency that awarded this, and we can ask if there's a way to reallocate, but there isn't a water supply project that springs to mind. We've got the North Wells and Reservoir Project, and we're doing the lead service line inventory under a separate funding portfolio, which is all, that planning study is actually 100% forgiveness, so it's, it's a loan that we won't pay back. Yeah. I just know if it's but, that close to being the end, they don't like giving money back to the feds either, so they might be able to figure something out different. Yeah. I just, yeah, I would hate to, yeah. Asking I know it's what not else was in their portfolio for that grant, 
when they got it, and then, then we'll see if we can fit into one of those categories. <laughs> Yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I, yeah. I, we'll, we'll, see what, we'll see what's possible. I wonder where the, what other shifts they have available. It seems to be that, I'm just saying it seems to be the time state funding, federal funding through the state is most flexible is when it's like in the last six months and about to pop. Pop is period of performance. It's when your date's up. Then your grant pops. <laughs> and, and we we never went through the whole grant agreement process in terms of the the elements to to get out of the award. We're pretty open and, and clear um, that there aren't any things that we have to to try to undo. We never did them in the first place, um, knowing that this was possible. And there was a period of time when construction bids came back and we didn't have enough money to do any of it. And as we cobbled together funding sources, that was sort of how we jumped and, and flipped that funding ratio. Um, so do you want to investigate that and come back in June? Or do you want a motion that if there is no other possibility, we'll turn it back? I think given the timing, if the motion can be constructed to say, direct us to explore if there are other ways to use the funds, and if not, to essentially say, thanks, but we're all set. So moved. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't going to have any cloud over who made that motion. <laughs> Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, I consider adopting the resolution for a change of authorized signers on the credit cards. Yeah, this is required with the vacancy in the office. We've got the assistant clerk treasurer, the finance director, and the manager on there. The vacancy obviously in the treasurer's office. It's really for the treasurer's vacancy. It's tied to who can make decisions related to the credit card functionally making most of them regarding use anyway. So this at least formalizes that and gives us a little bit of resiliency uh, in, in terms of if somebody in that triumvirate leaves, we still have two others who can take action. You know, at some point we may have to do this again when we do appoint somebody to the full-time long-term treasurer's gig, but this gets us rolling, keeps us rolling. Come on, Stephanie, where are you? Oh, so moved. <laughs> Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Manager's report. Uh, nothing new to add from what's written, we, other than we met with FEMA this morning on the December disaster, disaster declaration. That was the initial recovery scoping meeting, so we had everyone there that uh, was that went well um, we also should start to see more and more money come back from july we signed all the paperwork to get one hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars related to a suite of road projects coming back so those are two of the new developments today wouldn't be captured in that written report okay questions on the manager's report um, executive session. Got a handful of quick items. So two motion requirements. So one's the finding and the other one's the motion to enter. I scrambled all my papers, so I apologize. I can lead you to it here in a second. I'm just going to pull it up. Well, we've, we've got it in front of us, I think, on the... the yeah, on the, on the yeah so the first one... I can yeah, do it. So you got yeah, you do the finding and then do the, the one to enter. So we'll, we'll find that executive session is necessary and prudent and that premature general public knowledge will place the town at a disadvantage. Second. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And, and, and then the second motion is that we enter our executive session 
pursuant to 1 VSA 313A1A contracts and 1 VSA 313A1B collective bargaining, 1 VSA 313A1F attorney-client communications, 1 VSA 313A2 real estate, and 1 VSA 313A3 personnel. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 They're done.